Welcome to the Tall Poppies podcast. To find out more about our guests or the content of the program, including information about the musical excerpts, visit our website at tall-poppies.com. Brendan O'Shea welcoming you to another edition of Tall Poppies, a series of podcasts featuring Australian luminaries from around the world. Thank you for all your emails, which have been arriving from the many corners of the globe these last months. Don't forget to drop by the Tall Poppies website, where you'll find lots of background information about our guests. You can find it at tall-poppies.com. That's tall-poppies.com. Now, Tall Poppies was initially established with the support of the Australian Embassy in Berlin. In order for the podcast to continue, it relies on the generosity of its listeners. So if you enjoy tuning in, please consider sponsoring the project. To find out how to make a contribution, visit the support page on the Tall Poppies website. And remember, if you are enjoying the series, do share it around. Send the podcast's link off to friends and relatives or repost on social media. In this episode of Tall Poppies, we meet one of the world's most renowned ethical and political philosophers, Melbourne-born Peter Singer, who's best known for his work in bioethics and his role as one of the intellectual founders of the modern animal rights movement. I think that uh, if you look at the history of our species, uh, the story on the whole is one of progress, um, despite ups and downs and despite, of course, you know, the appalling things that happened in the mid-20th century. And you look at the last 70 years, you know, the post-Second World War period, it has been a, a generally a positive one, despite the fact that we have these huge problems, of which I think the greatest that we face at the moment is climate change. And I'm not particularly optimistic about our being able to deal with climate change before we really get some major disasters. Peter Singer studied philosophy and history at the University of Melbourne and at the University of Oxford, where he also served as Radcliffe Lecturer in Philosophy at University College. It was in 1975 that he wrote what would become his best-known and most influential work, the book Animal Liberation, A New Ethics for Our Treatment of Animals. After a period lecturing at the University of New York, Peter returned to Australia to where he has held various academic positions. In 1983, he became director of Monash's Centre for Human Bioethics and in 1992 co-director of its Institute for Ethics and Public Policy. Since 1999, Peter Singer has been the Ira W. de Camp Professor of Bioethics in the University Centre for Human Values at Princeton University in the United States, as well as being, since 2005, Laureate Professor at the Centre for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics at the University of Melbourne. Well, much of Peter Singer's career has been devoted to social and political causes, most notably animal rights, but also famine and poverty relief, environmentalism and reproductive rights. One of his first articles, entitled Famine, Affluence and Morality from 1972, was occasioned by the catastrophic cyclone in Bangladesh. It argues that affluent persons are morally obligated to donate far more resources to humanitarian causes than is considered normal in Western cultures. Among Peter's other publications to date are his books Practical Ethics, originally published in 1979, with a third edition published in 2011, Rethinking Life and Death, The Collapse of Our Traditional Ethics, which was published in 1994, and The Life You Can Save, Acting Now to End World Poverty, which dates from 2009. 
The publication Animal Liberation in 1975 greatly attributed to the growth of the animal rights movement by calling attention to the routine torture and abuse of countless animals in factory farms and in scientific research. At the same time, it generated significant new interest among ethical philosophers in the moral status of non-human animals. Indeed, the third annual Peter Singer Award, an accolade that is awarded to those working on strategies for the relief of animals in suffering, was recently presented in Berlin, and it was on this occasion that I met Peter Singer. Peter Singer, it's a great honour to meet you here in Berlin and thank you very much for coming on the podcast. I'm very happy to talk to you. <laughs> well, here we are in Germany, of course, and your roots go all the way back to Austria. Three of your grandparents didn't make it out of Europe. Your family, your parents made it to Melbourne and that's where you were born. There must have been forward thinking to see what was actually ahead of them in the sense of you know, moving to Melbourne at that stage. Uh, no, I don't think Austrian Jews had to be very forward-thinking to realise that they had no decent future in Austria. Of course, they didn't dream that they would all be murdered if they stayed. But almost immediately when the Nazis came to Austria, they passed laws saying that businesses could not be owned by Jews. So, you know, you had to, if you were, my father's father had a little um, factory that made umbrellas, um, he could not continue to own it anymore, had to sell it to an, a non-Jew. Uh, my mother had just recently graduated from the University of Vienna as a physician, and again the Nazis passed laws that uh, Jewish doctors could only treat Jewish patients. Now about a third of the doctors in Vienna were Jewish, um, and maybe 10% at the most of the population of Vienna was Jewish, so obviously there was going to be too many, too many doctors and too few patients under that ruling. Uh, so they both realised, and of course, apart from that, they were reviled, and in the first few days, they were humiliated by being forced to clean the streets and uh, clean public latrines and so on. So, you know, no, it was pretty clear for, for people of their age, um, with a whole life ahead of them, that they needed to leave. The problem was with the older people, with my grandparents, who couldn't really face very easily the idea of going somewhere else. How could they start a new career? There they would be language problems. Um, so they thought that maybe they would... In fact, my, my grandfather, who was a high school teacher, you know, had to retire very soon because uh, he was not allowed to continue to teach. But he thought he could live quietly in retirement you know, with his books and do some research and so on. Um, so, of course, they were mistaken about that. Uh, but he, he died in Theresienstadt, right? He, yes, my mother, that's, that's right. This is my, my mother's father. He died in Theresienstadt. Yeah. And he was also rather special in the sense that he co-authored something with Freud, right? That's correct, yes. Of course, much earlier. He was an expert in Greek and, well, in the classics, basically, uh, Greek and Latin, and very familiar with mythology and also with uh, the folk mythology of Eastern and Southeastern Europe. And he was interested in psychology always. Uh, so when he heard that Freud was giving some lectures at the University of Vienna, this was early on before Freud was famous, um, he went along and there was just about a dozen people, I think, who were listening to those first lectures. Uh, and then he sent Freud uh, a letter saying that he thought it would be interesting to interpret some myths in the light of psychoanalysis. And that struck a chord with Freud, who had also thought about that but didn't have, it, have the expertise that my grandfather had in um, the knowledge of, of the ancient myths. So Freud proposed that they work together and uh, my grandfather prepared a myth that he thought would be suitable for psychoanalytic interpretation and, and wrote them out and then Freud wrote some comments on those myths and they had a joint paper which they were going to publish but uh, just before it could be published, the split occurred between Freud and Alfred Adler, who was the leading uh, other member, I guess, of Freud's circle. And my grandfather sided with Adler. He thought Freud was behaving in a very authoritarian and uh, intolerant way, that he was preventing disagreement within the circle of, about his views. And he couldn't face that, so he sided with Adler and left. And anybody who sided with Adler in that dispute, Freud never talked to again. So um, the paper never got published, but somehow it survived. My grandmother, or my grandfather must have given it to non-Jewish friends when he and my grandmother were sent to Theresienstadt. 
and uh, recovered it when, it, when my grandmother survived and came back to Vienna after the war. And so she brought it out to Australia with her when she, she joined us in Australia in just, uh, just after I was born in 1946. And eventually my, my aunt um, took it to the Freud archive in the United States where its importance was recognised and it is now published as part of Freud's collected works. That is, of course, your, your grandfather Oppenheimer. And you actually then wrote a biography about him, didn't you? Yes, that's right. I wrote a, a, a biography, I guess you could call it, um, about him and my family to some extent, some other members, you know, the fate of my family, and his ideas about various things relating to, to Freud and relating to religion and to... Um, essentially questions about how to live. I was interested in exploring whether there was any connection between my ideas and his. Um, of course, I'd never known him. He died before I was born. Uh, I'd never really read any of the things he'd written because they were all written in German. And although I, I do read German, it's not that easy for me, especially if you get into things that are a little bit more academic. So, um, but I decided, decided in the 1990s, I would like to actually take the time to read his work and uh, to think about it and think about that connection. And in the end, I, I did write a, a book called Pushing Time Away about trying to get to know my grandfather. You, of course, are here in Germany again now. Three of your grandparents died, two of them in Lodz, I think, in, in Poland. And you've just mentioned already your grandfather, Oppenheim, in Theresienstadt. Your grandmother made it to Australia. And, of course, you're back here now for a very special occasion, because this is the third time that a prize that bears your name, the Peter Singer Prize, is being awarded here in Germany. Um, you obviously now have an OK relationship with Germany again? Yes, I, I think I do. Um, I don't blame people here in Germany now who, are, let's say, are my age or younger, that is, they were born after the war, um, I, I don't think it makes sense to, to blame them or put any guilt on them for what their parents or grandparents or great-grandparents, in the case of, of younger people, uh, may have done. I think uh, Germany has reckoned with its past uh, very openly. It's not tried to hide things or cover things up. Uh, you know, it did for some years, of course, after the war, during the Adenauer era, but I think uh, in, in the, for the last 30 years it's, it's been open, it's tried to compensate the victims of the Holocaust as far as that's possible, which not obvious, obviously not really possible, but it's made efforts to do what is, what is possible. So I don't think there's any point in, in saying, you know, Germany did these terrible things, therefore I'm, I'm not going to Germany. That doesn't make sense today. Of course, your grandparents were Austrian. How do you feel about Austria? Austria has been a little bit slow dealing with its past. Your grandparents and the fate of your family was sealed the Anschluss, wasn't it? Yes, that's certainly true. And, and you're right that, you know, Austria had this line that it was uh, Hitler's first victim because it's true that the, the German army marched over the border um, and there was never a, a free election in which Austrians agreed to join Nazi Germany. That is, the, the only election that was held was after the Nazis had taken over and uh, one can't consider that a free election. But on the other hand, of course, um, many, many Austrians did then enthusiastically participate in the enlarged uh, Nazi government uh, uh, and participated in the Holocaust in various ways. Uh, and I think Austria could have been a little more open and upfront than it was. But, you know, still I think the same kind of things prevail uh, today in that, again, we've got completely different generations who I think don't, you know, don't bear any responsibility for what happened. There may still be elements of anti-Semitism, uh, perhaps more prominent in Austria than, than in Germany. Uh, I've seen some evidence of, of that perhaps, but, but again, I, I don't think it's typical of, uh, of Austria as a whole. So I'm quite prepared to, to visit Austria and to uh, accept the very friendly relations that I have with many Austrians and uh, particularly with Austrians in academic life. I'm not sort of constantly thinking about the past when I'm there. So life in, in Melbourne, the, the son of two refugees, you of course went to school, fairly normal Melbourne sort of life, Press Hill and then Scotch College, then University of Melbourne, all the while up until 71 and that, that particular essay that you wrote at that time. What led you to that very first big paper of yours? 
as you say, I went to the University of Melbourne. I studied. Uh, I ended up studying philosophy. Uh, I'd, I'd actually started doing an arts law degree, and I was when I went to university, I thought I would become a lawyer. But uh, I got interested in philosophy and um, did a master's degree, and then I got a scholarship to go to Oxford. So uh, there I was, a graduate student at, at Oxford. And in fact, by the time we're talking about it, when I started writing Famine, Affluence and Morality, I completed my graduate studies there, and I'd accepted a, a teaching position at University College Oxford, uh, a kind of temporary two-year position replacing one of the professors there who'd uh, got a a grant to do some research. I'd become very interested in trying to apply ethics in the, in the world. Uh, this was, of course, in the early 70s. It was a big student movement demanding relevance, that courses should be relevant to issues that we were concerned with, issues like the, Viet the war in Vietnam, civil rights. And I was particularly interested in the question of global poverty and, and what should we, people living comfortably in affluent countries, be doing about the fact that there were a billion or so people living in extreme poverty. And then at that time, um, this huge crisis occurred in uh, what was then East Pakistan and is now Bangladesh, uh, where there was an election which uh, elected a party that was favoring greater autonomy for East Pakistan. The Pakistani army put that down, um, you know, uh, moved in and repressed that movement for greater autonomy uh, very bloodily. Millions of refugees, I think nine million refugees, fled across the border into India, and India was temporarily housing them um, and feeding them, but you know, nine million people, it's uh, an immense thing, and India was a poorer country then than it is today. So of course India called to the West for um, assistance, and very little assistance was forthcoming. And I thought, you know, how can this be? Uh, how can we go on living our normal lives when there's nine million people who are in, in danger of starving or of uh, epidemics of cholera or something sweeping through the refugee camps because of inadequate sanitation. So um, I decided to write something about that situation and to argue that we do have obligations to help, that it's not just nice to help, it's not just charity, but it's actually wrong if we, if we don't help, if we go on living our comfortable lives, ignoring the plight of people in extreme poverty, then we're doing something wrong. And I was fortunate in that there was just a new journal established called Philosophy and Public Affairs, which was trying to bring philosophy into public affairs, and they accepted that. It was part of the first volume they published and got around. It got anthologized. It was, became very widely used in teaching and philosophy courses, and it's certainly one of the things that uh, helped me to become well known. Let's go back to the fact we're here in Germany. In 89 and 90, you raised quite a lot of protests as far as your book, Practical Ethics. You've rewritten that book, Twice, basically, you've updated it and added various chapters. One of the chapters that's not in the 2011 one is the one about refugees. Why was that the case? Um, so there was a chapter about uh, refugees that was added to the second edition. I think that was the 1990 edition. And by the time I was writing the 2011 edition, that problem had grown very considerably and was very specific to a variety of different countries. It had, it had become a bigger issue, but there was a particular question about refugees in Europe. There were somewhat different questions about refugees and, of course, the detention camps that were set up in Australia. And then there were questions about immigration, not necessarily just refugees, in the United States. And I did think about trying to write, uh, rewrite the chapter to take account of all those debates. But in the end, I decided that it was going to be a very complicated, um, messy kind of chapter to do that. And I thought it doesn't really belong in a book of this kind, which is looking at, if you like, more, more general principles rather than specific situations, you know, what is the situation now in Australia, what is the situation now in Europe, what is the situation now in the United States. So that's why in the end I, I left it out and I included another chapter on uh, climate change that hadn't been in earlier editions because that hadn't been an issue. You know, it's, it's certainly not that I don't think it's an important issue, it is an important issue, but it's, it, I think it had just become a more complicated one during that period. In Germany, of course, Angela Merkel has come under a lot of criticism for her policies on refugees. However, my experience living here, I see that a lot of the problems that people thought might happen haven't actually been the case. What did you think in 2016 when the refugee crisis hit Europe? 
Well, I thought Angela Merkel was extremely brave in, in taking the stance that she did in, in saying that asylum seekers have a right and uh, essentially however many came, Germany had to accept. So uh, I, I admire a politician with that kind of courage. It's, it's all too rare to find politicians who are prepared to take a stand on, on principle. And I was hopeful that she would not pay too big a political price for it. Um, obviously, she has paid some political price for it. And I think she now realizes that she has had to back away a little bit from the, the stance that she took, which seemed to be, you know, I remember one of her statements, which really seemed to imply that if you were a genuine seeker of, of asylum and you got to Germany, you were going to be accepted. And I do think that's unrealistic, right? I mean, one has to be aware that societies will only accept a certain proportion of outsiders coming in without uh, really getting into uh, a situation where they will find uh, that they're just not willing to accept more. And then, of course, they will inflict the price on the government at the polls. So I say this reluctantly, but I think you have to now be aware of the danger that if you don't place some limits on refugee intake, you will be replaced as a political leader by a party that is much, much worse than the party you are representing. Uh, you have to be that realistic. So I, as I said, I greatly admired Angela Merkel for what she did, but I will also accept that it would be reasonable now to have some restrictions on additional uh, refugees coming into Germany or coming into the European Union as a whole because otherwise we simply are going to reverse the gains made. We'll have uh, governments hostile to immigrants. They're very likely also to be governments that are uh, much worse on other aspects like what well, we see it in, in the United States, for example, that I think Trump was elected partly because of his anti-immigrant stance that was popular in some areas and after all he didn't win by very much in the end. In fact, he didn't even get a majority of votes but but he did win. But in addition to him taking measures that are hostile to immigrants or trying to take them, he's also, of course, abandoned efforts to do something about climate change, which globally is going to be a much bigger disaster. And if something like that were to happen in Europe, if you were to get right-wing governments that said climate change is a hoax or whatever, mm -hmm. um, that would compound the problem. So I think you have to have a look at the political realities as well as the moral principles. Would you apply that also for Australia? Uh, well, yes, to some extent, I think that does apply to Australia. I regret that Australia doesn't seem to be very tolerant of uh, asylum seekers coming to the country in boats. It's interesting, though, that Australia does take quite a lot of refugees in proportion to its population, of course, and it doesn't seem to be such a problem for Australians to take refugees if they are legal immigrants. So it's a kind of a trade-off, again, I think. Uh, if you were to say we'll except people who arrive in boats, you know, in, well, certainly in any significant numbers, uh, it seems that that's kind of a red flag to the electorate and you're, you're likely to get voted out of office. Um, but on the other hand, you can take substantial numbers of refugees. And you know, from my perspective, that's what's important. Uh, and, and going back to the 1990 chapter that I wrote in, in Practical Ethics, uh, I do think we have a, an obligation to take significant numbers of refugees. But... To me, a refugee is a refugee and a, and a person arriving in a boat doesn't have a, a prior claim that a person living in a refugee camp has. So I'm happy that Australia is taking a substantial number of refugees. We could take even more. But to me, that's what's important. The overall number of refugees we're accepting, not whether we accept people who come in boats or don't. On top of that, of course, with Australia, there is the issue of the uh, detention camps and the inhumane conditions there and the fact that people have been locked up there for a long time. I deplore that that's been the, the response to the problem. Of course, that time at Oxford was also significant in another way with your book, Animal Liberation. Tell us about that first decision to actually create that book. You were out on a limb. There wasn't any other sort of literature around where people were talking about animal rights at that time in the mid-'70s. Yes, that's true, and, and that was really why I wanted to write the book. I became aware of the issue really through a chance encounter with a Canadian graduate student who had decided not to eat meat because he didn't approve the way we treated animals. And of course, you, you, know, you would meet many such people nowadays, but that was really the first time I'd met anyone 
who was a vegetarian for that kind of reason, you know, not because he was a Hindu or not because he thought meat would be bad for his health, but just directly because of concern for animals. So I thought about that and it did strike me that this is a really big issue that's completely neglected. As you say, there was nothing really written about it, nobody was talking about it. There was one book that I found describing factory farming it was not at all a bestseller. It was um, hardly known, but uh, it did document the facts of factory farming, and I was able to draw on that. I also looked at questions of what was being done to animals in, in experiments. And uh, the first thing I wrote actually was a, an article for the New York Review of Books in 1973, but that then produced a strongly positive response, uh, some encouragement to actually do a book on the area. So that's why I, I didn't... I didn't write Animal Liberation while I was still in Oxford. I actually did the writing after I uh, moved to New York, where I had a, a visiting position at New York University. But I did think it was necessary to try and get something out there that would explain why we're not justified in just treating animals as things that we use for our, for our ends. Indeed. And, you know, to this day, of course, this is one of the things that you're still very, very busy with. 65 billion animals, right? die approximately, probably more, die each year, are uh, bred to be slaughtered. Yeah, 65 million land animals, actually. If you include fish, the number gets yeah, vastly yeah, higher. Yeah, yeah, it gets to a trillion, according to estimates that I've seen. But yes, just land animals alone, most of them living miserable lives in factory farms, and a number that is still increasing, uh, unfortunately, because as nations like China become more prosperous, people can afford more meat, and they're, they're eating more meat. So... Uh, it's, it's an enormous problem it, just in terms of the vast amount of suffering we inflict on animals. It's a big problem in terms of the contribution to climate change that livestock makes, bigger than the whole of the transport industry. And uh, I think it's a, it's a health issue as well. I think there are health concerns about people eating as much meat as they do. So the problem is still with us, it's still growing. I've been here at this meeting um, just outside Berlin talking to many animal activists who've come for this event here and uh, everybody is very appropriately concerned. There are some very encouraging stories of progress, but of course there are also discouraging stories of the totally horrible things that are still happening to animals. And of the fact that this, although the number of vegetarians and vegans is growing, we still haven't really broken through. You know, we, we would like to make eating meat as much uh, marginalized as much as, as smoking is marginalized now. And we certainly haven't got to that point yet. You're also a, a, a vegan, aren't you, most of the time? Yes, I'm a, generally a vegan. I'm somewhat flexible, particularly if I'm traveling and it's you know, difficult to be completely vegan. I'll you know, eat something that maybe has some, some dairy or some egg in it. It's not a religion for me, so I'm not absolutely strict. I'm just trying to minimize the support I give to animal industries. There's a lot of discussion, of course, here in Germany about veganism and just how ethical it is in many ways. The lead trail that leads to a lot of the, the products that people use here as substitutes for various other things and, and the whole sort of buying force behind it all, the economics, the commercial aspect of it all. What do you say to people that, are, that say, well, you know, veganism's fine, but actually it's doing more damage than, uh, than good? I think it's a complete myth. I, I don't think there's any basis for the claim that it's doing more damage than good. I think people make up excuses to um, avoid confronting the fact that they're Diet is inflicting a huge amount of suffering on animals and responsible for a great deal of, of greenhouse gases. And there's absolutely no reason why a vegan diet should in any way contribute to the kinds of things that an animal-based diet does. Um, you know, of course, if you choose to eat certain products that are not environmentally desirable or that um, have particular problems of their own, then you can find a, a diet that is still vegan but is, is not a great diet. But you know, there's, there's absolutely no reason why eliminating animal products from your diet should have any harmful consequences at all. Mm. Let's look ahead at, at a, a couple of other issues as far as animal rights goes. And, and, you know, just in the last couple of days, there's been some matter found on Mars that possibly is remnants of... Or, or was alive. Was alive, yeah. So what about... What happens if we do actually discover something on another planet. How do we have to approach this? Uh, that's certainly true of Mars. We, we don't, as I understand, we don't actually know that there was a living organism. We simply know that there's organic carbon-based matter um, and whether it was alive or not from the reports I've seen has not yet been decided. But, you know, no doubt elsewhere in the universe there are 
untold billions of planets um, and there will be life on some of those planets. What is important in my view is whether that life is conscious, um, whether it's there are beings who can suffer or enjoy their life, be happy uh, or not, and if so, then we ought to treat those beings with the same sort of consideration we give to our own interests and to the interests of non-human animals on this planet. So I don't think that the questions are fundamentally different because they come from another planet. It will be perhaps difficult to, de to decide whether some life forms are conscious or not, but it's already difficult to decide uh, you know, whether are bees conscious or not, for instance, right? Most people think that insects are, are not conscious, but that's not really very soundly based, and certainly bees communicate in remarkable ways. Mm. Um, it's possible that they do this without having consciousness, but it's also possible that they are conscious beings and should be considered alongside the vertebrate animals who we assume are conscious. So uh, we have these mysteries on our own planet, and uh, if we do discover life on other planets, that will increase the range of the mysteries, but I don't think it'll be fundamentally different. Professor Singer, what we're talking about here is basically one of the underlying fundamental aspects of your work, and that is, of course, to be aware of the suffering of others and to try and prevent it as much as possible. How far have you got in your quest to make people more aware of their responsibility in that respect for others? I think I've had some impact. Um, you know, the, lots of people who tell me that they've read my work and it's changed their lives in various ways, and I'm really very pleased when something that I've written changes people's lives. I think that's the highest compliment anyone can pay you. And I strongly believe that philosophy can and should have that uh, impact on the world. So, yes, I've, I, I've made some progress and done some good. I think I can say that quite confidently. On the other hand, we're talking about a vast problem. We're talking about, if you like, a constant effort to reach more people against various influences that push people in the other direction. So there's still a very long way to go. You're teaching and you're lecturing and you're dealing with different generations. Are you sensing a difference in the various generations as they go through about their awareness of, of world issues? Uh, I think that students that I've been teaching at Princeton over the last decade uh, perhaps are somewhat more idealistic than um, students who I taught in Australia beforehand uh, and perhaps a little bit more than when I first came to Princeton although that's not easy to judge and of course the comparisons between Australia and the US you know maybe they're just different selections of students or something like that. I do think there are quite a few idealistic people in, in the current generation of students and the generations that I've taught for the last decade so uh, that's encouraging, particularly when uh, I teach at Princeton. A lot of these people are going to go on to be leaders in various ways. Uh, so it's good to know that there are people out there who will be leaders of America in generations to come who do strongly believe that they can and should be doing something to make the world a better place. Of course, altruism is one of the, the other themes that comes into this, looking at yourself, seeing how much you can perhaps contribute to evening things up in the world. A lot of the examples that you use are people that are earning large amounts of money. I'm wondering about the other people, though, that aren't in that category, that don't have that sort of income, and how they can actually also contribute or want to contribute, or should they be worrying about contributing? Um, I, but I do talk about people who don't have much money, and, for example, the book the most good you can do, which is yes. my book about effective altruism. Talk about someone from Brazil who um, recently had to move out of the room he was renting and packed up all his possessions in his backpack and picked up his guitar and, and that was everything he owned in the world. Uh, and yet despite that, he was giving 10% of his income to uh, effective charities. So uh, this is not only something for wealthy people. Of course, there are people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett who have enormous fortunes and who fortunately have used that money to do good in the world uh, and that's that's great and I think they deserve commendation and um, there's some others that I've written about in the book who have lesser but still significant amounts of money. But one of the points that I make is that uh, especially young people who haven't yet decided on their career or have career options open can think about what career will do the most good and so it, it isn't only by giving away money that uh, you do good as an effective altruist. It's also by 
what you do in your in your life and your working hours. So I think that this is something that is an option for everyone. I don't want the effective altruism movement to be seen as uh, just a movement for wealthy people. There's a lot of what you would like us to do and to follow through is about getting out of our comfort zone. That probably makes you quite unpopular. Uh, so it, it has both effects, yes. It, it means that I, you know, there are newspaper columnists who like to ridicule my views because it makes them uncomfortable, I guess. And there are quite a few people who respond to that challenge and uh, see it as inspiring a different way of living and who relish that and do very well. Uh, you know, find that they're living in accordance with their values, who find that they have purposes, you know, in life that they didn't have before and who think that this has greatly improved their lives. So uh, it just depends on who the person is and how willing they are to consider something that is outside their comfort zone. That's really what, what makes the difference. Life in America with Trump, how has this changed your work? How has this changed the reception of a number of other aspects of your output? I don't think Trump has really changed my work very much. Uh, he certainly you know, changed the atmosphere and there's a lot of people are quite depressed about, about Trump and, and gloomy about the future. I'm hoping that he will prove to be a temporary aberration. I'm hoping that the congressional elections that will be held this coming November will show that the majority of Americans repudiate uh, Trump and repudiate his Republican supporters and that we won't have to put up with him for more than a total of, of four year, one four-year term. But he is, you know, he's definitely doing untold harm during that period and you know, four years without any real action on climate change is in itself a disaster, plus, of course, a lot of other things that he's been doing, um, cutting funds for non-profit organisations that uh, provide contraception to people in developing countries because they don't have a clear policy that says that they will never tolerate abortion or something of that sort. Um, that's done a lot of harm to women and couples in, in developing countries and, and to the environment. And there are you know, many, many other things that are going backwards because of Trump. So, so it's gloomy, but in terms of the work that I do, I wouldn't say that it's had any kind of major impact. What about Australia and climate change? We have that sun, we have dreadful droughts that are happening at the moment. Well, the, the Turnbull government has been a big disappointment um, on a number of issues and none more than climate change because Malcolm Turnbull actually has been quite clear that he thinks that climate change is a real problem. And initially when he was leader of the opposition, he thought that we needed to do something about it. He supported the idea of a carbon tax of some sort or a cap and trade scheme. And now that he's Prime Minister and has been for some time, he seems to be completely kowtowing to those right-wing forces in the Liberal Party who don't accept that view. Uh, and Australia is not doing nearly enough. And as you say, Australia is one of the countries that is really already hit by very severe droughts. The government's not saying that climate change is a factor here, but most experts think that climate change is exacerbating the situation. Not that we haven't had droughts before, but we are clearly having higher temperatures, um, particularly in inland Australia, than we had before. And if you have uh, limited water, then you have, with higher temperatures, you have higher evaporation and the, the surface water disappears. So I think Australia should be standing up and, and saying, we are suffering from climate change. Areas that where we used to be able to produce crops or run animals, if you accept you know, grazing animals, uh, we can no longer do this, we're losing them, and we're going to take uh, a strong stance, we're going to bring in our own carbon tax and call on other countries to do the same. I think we have a real leadership potential there that unfortunately the present government is simply not exercising. I think Australians uh, would be prepared to follow a leader who took a strong stance. If you go back to 2007, when Kevin Rudd was elected, he had talked about climate change and he won a good majority. It's very unfortunate that he appears to have been talked out of actually taking action on it by his cabinet. And then Julia Gillard later tried to do something and of course got uh, wind back. So I think Australians would certainly support a leader who said we need to take action for the, for the benefit of our own country as well as the world. You mentioned Kevin Rudd. Kevin Rudd is, of course, the Prime Minister who apologised to the Indigenous peoples of Australia. How do you think Australia is actually approaching that huge tragedy? Um, I think Australia is doing what it can um, with regard to that. I think the apology was an important step. 
and Australia is trying to do things like to bridge the gap in life expectancy between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. We certainly you know, are, are doing our best to provide a full range of services to Indigenous Australians, even when they live in quite remote areas, and to provide additional services that correspond to their particular needs in those areas. It's a difficult problem, I think. You know, we shouldn't make light of the idea of how we can help a different culture, different people who to some extent have lost their traditional structures, their respect for elders, obviously, is something that you can well understand in a society where the knowledge that elders have remains as relevant to the next generation. But now in a society where there's so much change, you know, we, we see it ourselves, right? How many of us look to our children to help us with some new device on our phone or, or some app or whatever, right? So it's a difficult situation and it's uh, certainly made more difficult by the susceptibility of some indigenous people to alcohol and uh, uh, the domestic violence that that leads to. So I think we shouldn't underestimate the difficulty of the problem and we shouldn't assume from the fact that we haven't solved the problem that that longevity gap is still there. For example, we shouldn't assume that this is based on racism or neglect of the problem. Um, I don't think it is. I think it's based on the inherent difficulty of the changing, making change here. You return to Australia frequently. You've still got a position at the University of Melbourne and you're very, very much involved in it in that, in that respect. There's still a very good Australian accent there. Um, how Australian do you feel most of the time and has it ever been a negative thing? Uh, I feel very Australian. I, feel, I, I don't feel um, American really at all. And of course, you know, one thing that the election of Trump has done, I guess, it's, <laughs> it's made it even clearer that I don't feel American. Although I, I should say that you know, if you're around Princeton or New York or the East Coast in general, um, you don't find many Trump supporters. So, um, but but I, I do feel, when I get back to Australia, I feel very much at home there. In a way, it is clearly my culture and my country in a way that when I'm in the United States, uh, it's not. I am a foreigner. Do I feel any disadvantage of being an Australian? Not really. You know, when I went to England as a, as a graduate student, uh, there was a little bit of snobbery, I think. There was a little bit of these colonials, you know, brash colonials who came here and, uh, and didn't quite know how to behave, something like that. So I probably felt a little bit inferior as an Australian in Oxford for a while, but, but not for very long. Um, and I don't feel that at all in America. Uh, and actually in Europe, I think, you know, it's really positive. I make sure people know that I'm an Australian, I'm not an American, um, because there is still some... Uh, anti-American prejudices here, which are prejudices if they're directed at individuals, right? They, they may, may, may be justified criticisms of what the American government does, especially under Trump. But since a majority of Americans voted against Trump, uh, you can't assume that some, from the fact that someone's an American that they are a supporter. What about that wonderful big island of ours? What are the most important things that that country is going to have to face to make sure that it moves itself forward in a positive way? We've already mentioned climate change. Um, that's a huge issue that Australia is going to face because it's a, a big island with generally low rainfall and hot temperatures in many parts of it. So that's a huge issue that we have to face. Immigration is a general issue. We talked a bit about refugees and asylum seekers, but Australia is taking a large number of immigrants now as well. And I think that will need careful handling. Uh, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not opposing it at all. I think it's a good thing that we're becoming more more diverse and that we're accepting people who want to come to Australia and have a, a, a different kind of life. But, you know, communities out there um, that do not have all the infrastructure, there are planned communities developed without much in the way of parks, schools may not be adequate for the population that's growing there, public transport is being put in to some extent, but the, the trains are already full, I believe. Um, going out in those areas. So we do need to make sure that if we're bringing people in, the need to make sure that we fully integrate them in society and don't uh, kind of park them in areas outside the big cities where they'll form kind of quasi-ghetto communities without adequate infrastructure. Um, I think uh, it's important to really develop this growing society that we have in a, in a proper integrated way and then I think it can be a huge benefit to Australia in producing diversity and uh, people with different ideas that can help Australia to grow. Uh, so I think Australia, you know, obviously is, will remain for the foreseeable future a relatively small country, but I think it is a, a country that can play an important international role. Do you think the location of Australia being so far away from the rest of the world 
actually leads Australians to think that what happens there doesn't have any impact in other parts of the world? No, I have to say that's not really my impression. I think you know, the significance of distance, I, I remember Geoffrey Blaney's book, The Tyranny of Distance, um, which historically was very important in Australia, but is no longer important now. Uh, mm. Even when, when I first went back to Australia as an academic, I remember, which was 1975, even there, distance mattered because in order to find out what your colleagues in philosophy were writing, you had to wait for the new issues of the journals to arrive. And, and they came by surface mail, believe it or not. You know, it was too expensive to airmail them. So uh, they would take two or three months um, and your people over in America or England would be reading them before you even got them. Um, you know, and it was very hard to actually work to, say, co-author an article with somebody, even if you were going to send this manuscript back and forth by airmail, it would still take two weeks before you got a response to anything. Um, the telephone was really too expensive to use for any long discussions. Um, and all that has, of course, totally changed. Now I can work, uh, when I'm in Australia, I can work as easily with a colleague in Princeton as I would if I was down the corridor. It really makes no difference. Um, so I think distance has shrunk a lot, and I, I don't get the sense that uh, Australians have a different attitude to the rest of the world because geographically they're in a different corner of it. Of course, one of the things about distance is all of that travel. Now, if we are going to be aware of environmental issues, should we be thinking less about taking that plane and flying to various places, or should we get rid of our cars and jump on our bikes, and should we walk? All of these things that we can contribute in that respect. Uh, how can we practically involve ourselves? Yeah, all of those things. Um, we should certainly think about how much we fly, and although I, I, I'm in Europe now... Um, <laughs> As I've been telling people here, uh, I don't accept invitations to go to Europe to give a, a single talk or go to a single conference. I'm here for a month, so I'm traveling within Europe quite a lot. But of course, compared to the trip to Europe, that's a very short trip. And, and a lot of the travel that I'm doing is by train, by the way. And Australia can certainly learn from the high-speed train systems that Europe has. So I come over and I pack in a lot of things, which I hope do some good. And then I'll go back again. When I'm in the United States, I don't own a car. I use public transport. Occasionally, I may need to hire a car, but otherwise, I'll use public transport. And in Australia, it's a little bit harder. Public transport is not quite as good, but it's not bad. So um, I don't use a car. You know, Certainly, when I'm living in Melbourne and going to Melbourne University, I just hop on the tram. It's very easy and convenient, and I think we should be doing that as much as we can. What comes through very clearly for me is that you're actually quite an optimist. Yes, I think that's true. I think that uh, if you look at the history of our species, uh, the story on the whole is one of progress, um, despite ups and downs and despite, of course, you know, the appalling things that happened in the mid-20th century that we were talking about earlier. But the long-term trajectory, I think, is, as, as Stephen Pinker has plausibly argued, uh, one in which your chances of meeting a violent death at the hands of your fellow humans, or for that matter of, of other animals have been steadily reducing over the centuries and millennia. Uh, and you look at the last uh, 70 years, you know, the post-Second World War period, and it has been a, a generally a positive one, one of uh, mat increasing material progress, reducing poverty, increasing literacy, reducing child mortality, and reducing violent death. So I think that does give us some ground for optimism, despite the fact that we have these huge problems, of which I think the greatest that we face at the moment is climate change. And I'm not particularly optimistic about our being able to deal with climate change before we really get some major disasters. When I listen to you, I'm wondering about how the effects of being the son of a refugee in Melbourne and how this has influenced the rest of your life. Were you aware of the tragic circumstances of what happened to your, your grandparents and, and was that present in your house in Melbourne when you were growing up? Oh, of course, it was always present, yes. Yeah, I always knew what had happened. I knew why I uh, only had one grandparent, whereas people I went to school with had four. My parents moved in circles. Many of their friends were also refugees. There were people who had tattoos on their arms because they'd been in, in camps um, and had managed to survive. Uh, that was extremely present. And from my parents, I obviously got this uh, abhorrence of, of racism um, and also, I would say, of authoritarian government and the use of 
brutality and, and violence as part of a political um, and racist process because, you know, they had suffered through that um, and obviously, you know, I was very interested in history actually from quite an early age, so I read quite a lot about uh, the Nazis um, once I, you know, I don't know, from the age of 12 on, let's say. And, and one of the things that did impress me was that this was a violent breakdown of uh, law and order. And so the idea of having a society with law and order, or having a society in which people are free to speak their minds, in which you have free press or free media, and in which you maintain the rule of law is extremely important. It's a, an important bulwark against people getting into power who will use it in racist or essentially fascist ways. Peter Singer, it's been a great honour for me to meet you. It's terrific to meet this, this wonderful Australian who's had such an influence on so many of us over the years and hopefully will continue to do so for the time ahead. Thanks very much. I've enjoyed talking to you. I certainly hope it's all down there on your card. Um, if it's not, well, I guess we just have to say we had an enjoyable conversation and leave it at that. Thanks, Brendan. Renowned ethical and political philosopher, Professor Peter Singer. Now, if you'd like to find out more about Peter Singer's work or pursue the long list of his publications, then do visit the Tall Poppies website, tall-poppies.com, or send us an email to info at tall poppies.com. Tall Poppies, the podcast, was produced in Berlin by me, Brendan O'Shea. Special thanks to sound engineer Jürgen Kuhn for his help in this production. Also to Ed and Erica Friesen and Jane Oldham for their input into the program. It was nice to have you with us today. I'm Brendan O'Shea. I'll look forward to welcoming you to our next edition of Tall Poppies very soon. Goodbye. <laughs>